distinct honor tonight to introduce Eve Ewing and ta Coates and to welcome all of you to the Greenberg Theater for what promises to be an enlightening conversation between these two celebrated authors, educators, and culture critics. Dr. Eve L. Ewing is a journalist, poet, playwright, visual artist, sociologist of education, and assistant professor at the University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration. Her research focuses on the impact of racism and social inequality on schools and on the lives of the young. She's the author of the stunning volume that you will have a chance to purchase tonight, Electric Arches, which was named one of the year's best books by NPR and the Chicago Tribune. Her new book, which she will discuss, is Ghosts in the Schoolyard, Racism at School Closings on Chicago's South Side. Dr. Ewing also writes the Iron Heart, Heart comic book series for Marvel. Interviewing her will be renowned author and journalist ta Coates, whom we are delighted to welcome back to American University after a four years of absence. Mr. Coates is a national correspondent for The Atlantic, where he writes about issues of racial, social, and cultural inequality, and a distinguished writer in residence at NYU's Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. He's the best-selling author of, uh, with many national awards to his name, including a MacArthur Fellowship, also known as the MacArthur Genius Grant, uh, and a 2015 National Book Award for his insightful and moving volume, Between the World and Me. And as I'm sure you know, he is the current author of the Marvel comics, The Black Panther and Captain America. I'd like to extend special thanks to Professor Carl Dargan, who you'll hear from in a moment, uh, to Mimi Fittig, who has helped organize this, and to the entire Greenberg staff. This is a very heavy lift to pull together an event like this, uh, and I really want to, to thank our colleagues. And with that, please join me in welcoming Eve Ewing and ta Coates to American University. How's everybody doing? How's it going? All right, okay. All right. We stood back there for like 10 seconds trying to figure out who was going to sit in which <laughs> chair. <laughs> what? Okay, so I think it was, actually I had it backwards, because my idea was that the star goes first. That's actually, you. No, no, but I think the star goes second, so that was you, so I had it backwards. Well, so we it made it, we made okay. it, it's All right. okay. Okay. It's okay. All right. um, so I, um, I, uh, with uh, some regret uh, due to some, some changes in my life, don't get the chance to do something I used to do quite a bit earlier in my career, and that is um, sit and you know, uh, be intellectual and be curious uh, about writers who inspire me, uh, who I find to be deeply profound and who I find to be engaging the questions uh, that shape our society uh, today. <coughs> and so it, it, it's a real treat uh, to be here with Eve Ewing. It's kind of a throwback uh, for me. I was texting her earlier today, and I was like, how much time do we have? Because I have so many fucking questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> but I know the audience has questions, so I'm going to try to do this right. I'm going to try to be good to you guys um, and not just go, go with my, my questions. I, I'm, I met Eve um, through, through Twitter, back when I was on Twitter, um, when I had an actual Twitter presence. And I think I was actually working on uh, Between the World and Me, and I was reading some old poetry by Robert Hayden. And I tweeted something random. You know how you, know, you just sort of tweet what you're thinking at the moment. And Eve Ewing answered. And I said, who is reading Robert Hayden? I have to follow them. And so um, everything uh, blew, bloomed uh, from there. And you know, I soon discovered Eve is not only a poet, uh, a sociologist, used to be a teacher, uh, uh, one of our you know, blooming experts in terms of education, and just a, a really, really brilliant writer. Thank you yeah. so much. No, all true, all true, all facts. Um, <laughs> So with, with all the glowing things out of the way, um, yeah, I think we're done we, now. Yeah, we can get it. We can get it started. I got a lot of tough questions. Okay, good, good. Yeah. All right. So Eve, you know, I, I wanted to actually take it back, and I was very interested. Um, like when I when I when I read Ghosts in the Schoolyard, one of my questions that I was left with is what school was to you as a young person, a younger person. Mm -hmm. um, were you a good student? Uh, how did you perceive school? Where, where, where was it in your life? 
Oh, that's such a good question. No one's ever asked me that before. I'm a journalist. Um, I know. Uh, are we okay on sound? I feel like I'm a little echoey. Okay, good. Um, so I have a complicated relationship with school. I've always loved school, and and I'm good at schooling, mm -hmm. right? I always say schools reward a comparatively limited set of mm -hmm. skills mm -hmm. among young people, mm -hmm. and I happen through basically happenstance to, to have some propensity in those skills. Mm -hmm. I'm good at talking, mm -hmm. right? Schools really uh, reward like verbal acuity. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very extroverted, schools reward that. And, uh, but the thing is, I didn't have, um, at a pretty young age, my parents, um, through partially circumstance, uh, basically stopped helping me do anything in school. Mm. And so I would always, I would always ace everything until uh, something required like parental involvement. Mm. So I would get like A's on everything. And then when it was time to make a diorama, I would mm. make like a garbage diorama, <laughs> you know, because I was like eight and had right. no ability to like right. marshal those resources. But those, those kind of school assignments that are really just measures of class mm -hmm. and your ability to uh, marshal class resources, mm -hmm. I would like fail fail abjectly at, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing was that I have a younger brother who attended the same school as me, and I always observed that he had wildly divergent experiences mm -hmm. than I did. Now, this was like the height of the 90s, right? And so what we understand now about black boys and suspension and expulsion, there wasn't a language for that. Mm -hmm. And so it was just my brother got in trouble all the time, mm -hmm. right? My brother uh, got really bad grades all the mm -hmm. time, even though he was really smart. Mm -hmm. And so at a pretty early age, I was like, this is like a little sus. Like, mm -hmm. I understand that this person comes from the same household as me. Mm -hmm. Is, is smart, I don't really know what that means, but mm -hmm. I know that he has a lot of capabilities. Mm -hmm. why, is he not why is he not rewarded in the same way mm -hmm. as I am? And there's a story that, um, that I, I don't remember, but he tells me this story, which is that when he was like nine or 10, he got kicked out of the classroom. And he was, the teacher put him in the hallway and he was sitting in the hallway and he was crying because mm -hmm. he'd been put out of the class. Mm -hmm. And I happened to be like going to the bathroom. So I left my class and I saw my brother like in the hallway mm -hmm. and I got really upset. And I was like, this is not like this shall not stand, mm -hmm. you know? And I took him, I, I took him down to the office and I was like, we need to call my mother right mm -hmm. now. Like the mm -hmm. teacher put my brother out of the class. And so those kinds of things early on made me feel like this is not for everybody, mm -hmm. you know? And that there were, that there were things outside of myself uh, what the world called meritocratic mm -hmm. or called me being deserving or me being smart were uh, also had to do with things outside of myself about how I was perceived and how other people were perceived differently. So how do you uh, go from that? Because I think like w with all writers, um, when we you know, choose a specific thing that we're interested in, when we try to take, take it back, a lot of times there's an initial suspicion that something about the world is right. in fact off. Um, how did you move from that period um, into being a teacher, understanding that was off and then negotiating that within the classroom. Yeah, oh man, if you want to really understand that grades are like a scam, mm. <laughs> as soon as you become the person mm. giving the grades, you're like, oh snap, yeah. like this is all fake, yeah. right? Like <laughs> this is all utterly made up, right? And uh, I remember, maybe I told you this, I told somebody this story recently, I, just having those early encounters as a teacher being 22 years old, mm -hmm. right? And having these, these young kids in front of you. And the thing about teaching is that um, I only became, I, people took me more seriously as an intellectual, mm. right? When mm -hmm. I left mm -hmm. the classroom, mm. because there is still this pursuit idea in our society that teaching is not an intellectual I'm sorry, pursuit. did you major in education? No, I majored in English. Okay, all right. So I have, yeah, shout out to the English majors. <laughs> You know, uh, so it's like the best. I'm so I'm, I thank God every day I major. I have an English degree. It's uh -huh. great. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I didn't major in education, but I got a I got a teacher. I got a teaching degree. I went for my master's, my first master's degree and got a teaching credential mm -hmm. in the state of Illinois, which I which I maintain because a couple of years ago I was visiting a teacher in the classroom and like volunteering and working with kids. And I hadn't been in the classroom in, as a full time teacher in years, but I was just visiting. And she was like, there was an emergency, like a kid cut themselves. And she's like, I got to go. You watch all the kids. Mm. And I was like, I am not legally able to do this. Right? Like, <laughs> and then I was ever since then, I was like, I need to keep up my teaching credentials. So I am still a licensed uh, teacher in the state of Illinois. I, it is, I can legally be left alone. Wait, would you children. ever go back? Uh, would I ever go back? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, teaching middle school is like, oh, this goes back to your <laughs> shout out to the person who loves middle school. Um, <laughs> 
so the to the question that you started to ask me and I became wildly divergent and tangential, the um, the thing about teaching is that it's not seen as an intellectually uh, mm -hmm. in, interrogative pursuit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that has a lot of historical stuff mm -hmm. to do with teaching as a historically feminized profession, mm -hmm. as what's mm -hmm. considered a caretaking profession, mm -hmm. right? Um, where there's this pyramid of there's like a man on top who's mm -hmm. the principal or the superintendent, and then there's mm -hmm. all the underling women mm -hmm. like caring for the babies, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, people began to take me more seriously as, a, as an intellectual mm -hmm. when I wasn't in the classroom, even though teaching remains, as far as I'm concerned, the most intellectually demanding mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. task that I've ever been engaged in. Um, because having to look at a bunch of young people, all of whom, like think of your son, right? Or mm -hmm. think of the, uh, the people that you know and love, the kids in your life, mm -hmm. and how hard it is to translate what you're trying to get them to understand mm -hmm. through the magical, miraculous, individual, idiosyncratic person that they mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. right? Multiply that by like 170 kids, right? right? right. Every day, you know? And that's so hard. And I think that, that that's intellectually addictive in a certain way. Mm -hmm. It's also extraordinarily draining. Mm -hmm. um, but I would absolutely do that again, yeah. You know, I think you make a great point. There's a terrible, terrible saying that is uh, those who can't do teach. Right, right. And when I started teaching, not even at the middle school level, and I say that because, you know, there's a level of difficulty there, but at the college level, I was like, it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's not right, true. Right. It's not true. Like, there's a difference between practicing something and being able to explain it to somebody, right. to teach somebody. That is a skill in and of itself, and I think, like, we don't always quite, quite get that. So you, you, you get into the classroom. How does your interest go from being in the classroom to actually studying uh, policy you know, uh, from, from, from a broader level? You start off as a student, then you start off as an actual practitioner, teacher mm -hmm. in the classroom, and now you're in this position now where you're studying it system-wide. What, what, what led you to that? Yeah, so there's, uh, there was a particular moment, which was that I, you know, growing up in Chicago, I always had an understanding of this policy landscape um, in a vague way. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was a kid, Paul Vallis, who has uh, become like a big figure, very influential um, to my, from my perspective, quite negatively influential person in the American public education landscape. He was the head of CPS when I was a student. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of kind of policy turmoil. And then Arnie Duncan, when I started teaching, Arnie Duncan was the superintendent. Mm -hmm. So Arnie Duncan was my boss when mm -hmm. I started teaching. Mm -hmm. So I had like a vague awareness of policy. Um, but there was a particular day when we had a we had a brand new superintendent, which in Chicago is called the CEO. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want a commentary on like the pervasive nature of market based neoliberal logic, yeah, yeah. No, no, I do want to so talk about that. So the CEO, yes. we had a new CEO because Arnie Duncan had left, and this person's name was Ron Huberman. Now Ron Huberman had been a beat cop. He had been like a, a, a cop on the streets. Mm -hmm. He was good at that, so they made him a police administrator. He was good at that, so they made him like mm. a top police guy. Mm. He was really good at laying people off. Mm -hmm. And the mayor was like, you know what, you're so good at laying people off, I want you to come mm -hmm. run public transportation. Mm -hmm. So then he ran the CTA, mm -hmm. and he laid off a bunch of people there and cut a bunch of buses. He, this, the mayor said, you know what, you're so good at that, I'm gonna bring mm -hmm. you to the schools, mm -hmm. right? So this man who, uh, one of my colleagues always called him the bus driver. He's like, I'm gonna listen to no bus driver telling me what to do, <laughs> right? So the person running the district is this, mm -hmm. this kind of career, like hatchet man, right. you know? And, uh, who's never worked in a Who's classroom. never worked in a classroom. Yeah. And, and so one day my, my principal was like, we have an 8 a.m. meeting. Now 8 a.m. meeting means like this is a disaster because right. 8 a.m. to 8.25 a.m. is uh -huh. like the time you have to get your life together before kids come, right? So to have an 8 a.m. meeting, like it is a crisis. So we have an 8 a.m. meeting and she's like, cancel your uh, vacations, pay off your credit cards, mm -hmm. get your resumes together because we're all, everybody's getting laid off, right? Everybody's getting laid off. And what she told us was, okay, teachers, you're probably safe, but we're not going to have lunchroom staff, lunchroom staff getting laid off, clerks getting laid off, security's getting laid off, assistant principal, all these people she had been told basically to save all this money. And the public was like, okay, it's great because you're not firing teachers. But I started thinking, okay, so I'm going to have a job and I'm going to come in. There's going to be 40 kids in my class. If somebody throws up, there's no custodian to come clean it. If a parent calls me and wants to talk to me, there's no clerk to answer the phone. Uh, if the heater is broken, there's no engineer to fix it. Like, what is this? And I, I had a kind of out-of-body experience where I felt that the building was literally crumbling around me. Like, I could see, like, the, the ceiling coming down. Yves, what year is this? 2010, 2010. Okay. Okay. And, 
and I go up to my classroom and I look at a bunch of eighth graders and I'm looking at them and I'm like, we're having a great year. Like I'm doing, I'm, I'm frankly killing it. Y'all are frankly killing it. You know, like we have this classroom cohesion. We're working together. We're, I have all these grants to do all these projects and we're reading and we're working on a play and we made a film and a podcast and we're doing all this cool stuff in my class. And I'm looking around like, who, I didn't do this. You didn't do this. No adult in this building that I can point to is responsible for this sense of utter devastation and doom. And so I had the very naive idea that I was going to try to find the person mm. who was, right, mm. and try to, uh, to figure it out. Mm. So that's how I became interested in policy. So that's 2010. Is Rom mayor yet? Rom became mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody hissed. Somebody hissed, yes. <laughs> uh, can you stop filming, please? Thank you. Um, Rom became mayor in 2011. Mm -hmm. uh, he ran for mayor in 2011 um, for his first term. So, so, so Mayor Daly had just, Daly. yeah, Daly had just announced that he was uh, stepping down. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to get distracted here, but I'm, I'm actually very interested in this um, because I, I, I had an incident when my son was in public school. Mm -hmm. And in New York City public school, they brought in uh, Kathy Black, who had been a, a magazine executive to be, yeah, everybody, <laughs> some people that. know this story. Yeah. Um, now, they, have, they hadn't adopted the term CEO. They adopted, you know, it was this idea of chancellor, but it was the same idea at this point, and I don't know. Chancellor is all, that's also a trip, but, yeah. but go on. Yeah, yes. um, and, and I don't know if this has changed, but at that point, there was a notion that if you had been successful in any sort of business endeavor, you therefore knew how to run a school system. Yes. And the New York City school system at that, and I think- The um, world, the city's, the right. nation's largest right. school district. And at that point, my son was in public school, and me and my wife- How old was he? Uh, Samari would have been 11, 12, something like that, mm -hmm. fifth grade, sixth grade, something like that. But it's like, when you asked me to put my son, this is my greatest possession, <clears throat> in the hands of somebody that's never even been in a classroom, never sent the kids to public school, mm -hmm. just don't know anything mm -hmm. about it at all. I, I, I want to know, how did we get to a point where we feel as though almost anyone, <laughs> anybody, anybody, yeah. anybody, anybody can yeah. do this. Like they well, wouldn't the put Kathy Black head of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the fire department of New York. They right, would not do right, that. They right, wouldn't make right. that head of cops. They right. would never do that. So how, where did we get to the point where it was like, school's ass, it's easy. Right. It's easy. Right. I think it's, it's this idea that the f there's something particular about the profession of teaching where people presume that the further away you are from it, the, m the more apt you are, right? And I think, to your question, how do we, how do we get there? I think there's a number of things. Um, number one, I think we as a society have moved more towards kind of technocratic uh, post-industrial ways of thinking about things, right? This is the same logic that says, you know, the way uh, Amazon is going to end employment discrimination is by having an algorithm mm -hmm. that uses all the data of its most successful employee. Mm -hmm. Do you see this? We talked about this. Mm -hmm. Like, we're going to take the data of all of our most successful employees and run it through an algorithm to find all the most successful people. Well, of course, this algorithm then, like, was wildly discriminatory mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because it was predicated on data from people that mm -hmm. were majority white men, right? Mm -hmm. So. It's the same kind of logic of like, we can automate, we can mm -hmm. quantify, right, uh, everything. But the thing that makes it particular about schools is um, that by and large, we're talking about this kind of logic happening in places where the people being served are poor people of color, mm -hmm. right, or low income people of color. Mm -hmm. And because because keep in mind, there are public schools all over the country mm -hmm. where these things don't happen. They would it's, not do this. They would not they do would this. They would not bring a magazine exactly from urban exact yes, districts, yes, right? Yes. And the we know that we live in a country that believes that people are poor because they're bad. Right. Right. People are poor. Black people in particular are poor because they're lazy. Right. And the idea is, how do you control? How do you discipline? How do you manage mm -hmm. them? Right. How do you process them in the most efficient? Mm -hmm way? Mm -hmm. How do you take the input and get the desired output mm -hmm. in the most efficient way? Mm -hmm. There's nothing in there about care, about nurturing, about mm -hmm. the magic of childhood, about kids being special, mm -hmm. right? Nothing like that. Those things are reserved for people who can pay for mm -hmm. private school, mm -hmm. who can pay for Montessori school or mm -hmm. Waldorf school or mm -hmm. special things, right? And that's why, you know, people like Rahm Emanuel or Barack Obama, they send their kids to the University of Chicago Lab mm -hmm. School, right? It's a private mm -hmm. school, costs $30,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Right. And 
uh, that is where those folks send their kids to school. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to other people's children, mm -hmm. um, to borrow a, a phrase from famous education scholar Lisa Delpit, when it comes to other people's children, it's about discipline and control. Mm -hmm. And the idea extends mm -hmm. to the teachers that these folks are fools, mm -hmm. that if they knew what they were doing, they would have fixed it by now, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And therefore, the best thing we can do is to celebrate the, to bring in the celebrated uh, business minds of our mm -hmm. generation to fix this. Mm -hmm. And I think that that extends to other aspects of our culture, like the fetishization of people like Steve Jobs, mm -hmm. right? A man mm -hmm. who became a wildly successful capitalist by abusing the people around mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. And that that is like a lauded, mm -hmm. that is our idea of genius, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I think that it also has to do with who is in the building. So I, we could stay here, but I, I want to, I was on this trajectory and got distracted. I got a million fucking questions for Eve. Um, <laughs> so we, we understand this trajectory because I, I want to head into the book, uh, Ghosts in the Schoolyard. And I think um, one of the, the great revelations for the book for me, even as somebody that was already sympathetic to a lot of what you said, is first of all, this notion of schools as public investment in the neighborhood and what it means to actually close a school. I think there are a lot of ordinary people who read a newspaper and they say, low test scores, we're closing the school. And they say, huh, that makes sense, school's failing. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things you do in that book is you open that conversation up and explode that myth. So can you just talk a, just a little bit about that? I know that's an open-ended question, yeah. but just, to, I'm, I'm just a little bit about what schools actually mean in those neighborhoods beyond test scores. Yeah, so I think that it's important to think about public schools and the landscape of everything else that is happening in Detroit, Chicago, mm -hmm. Philly, New York, mm -hmm. New Orleans, DC, right? These are places where the same communities that are heavily reliant on public school systems are also facing massive other forms of disinvestment and disenfranchisement, mm -hmm. right? Whether that's in housing, whether that's in access to health care, public transportation, mm -hmm. um, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sorry, just pause for a second. When you yeah. say reliant, can we just, just reliant household? Because I, I'm thinking you're saying beyond just reliant for learning how to read. Right. Reliant in, um, in a fundamental way that is necessary for survival on a day-to-day right. -day basis, right. right? Some people really need the public bus right. to, to live, right. Right? right? Some people need the public bus to get to work, right. to feed their families, right. right? And so there's a way in which... Uh, and some people only eat when they go to school. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Some people only eat when they go to school, mm -hmm. right? CPS, Chicago Public Schools, the last year I was teaching became... Uh, one did something that New York has now also done, which is saying we're going to make free breakfast available for all kids, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and when we were, when, when I was teaching, they switched to this thing called breakfast in the classroom, which is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, so <laughs> instead of kids, go, they called it, they're like, it's a new program. It's called Exciting. breakfast in the classroom. <laughs> in it, you will serve the children breakfast <laughs> in the classroom, <laughs> right? So my colleagues, like my fellow teachers. So they're giving teachers, you more work, actually. Well, my, the other teachers hated breakfast in the classroom. <laughs> they hated it. So the logic, of course, was that if kids had to show up early or uh, if they had to, if uh -huh. some people were playing on the playground right. and some people go in to eat, that it becomes too much of a disparity. So yes. instead, when the kids come in before they go to school, everybody, the Miss Hinton, the lunch lady, is yes. going to stand out and give everybody their breakfast okay. and you take okay. it into the classroom. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so other teachers hated breakfast right. in the classroom. They're like, this is unsanitary. This is not my job. This is, you know, and I, now granted, I had an eighth grade homeroom. You so I outsourced all of this. I was like, all right, Taylor, your job, who, you know, whose job is it to go around and check off who gets breakfast? Whose job is it to collect uh -huh. all the breakfast when uh -huh. we're done? Uh -huh. Whose job is it? I, I was like, I'm going to take attendance. Yeah. Breakfast is over at 9, 10. Yeah, yeah. Eat or don't. Yeah. Mind you, you know, but yeah. like we're d at nine ten, we will be doing something yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. And so I loved it because uh, my kids acted totally different because they ate, they yeah, ate breakfast, yeah, right? Yeah, and yeah. I was like, this is the greatest thing ever. <laughs> and now every but the people who had the fourth graders who spilled food on themselves all day, and so <laughs> they were not into this at all. They were like, it's great, you know, there's like crumbs on my floor, it's disgusting. <laughs> Um, but I loved it, and I think that people don't think about those basic services. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been in schools uh, before Christmas where, mm -hmm. I, you know, I've sat in, in classrooms and wrapped gifts mm -hmm. for kids because mm -hmm. that's going to be the only Christmas mm -hmm. gift that they get, right? Mm -hmm. um, every year I do this program with the Chicago Sun-Times where they, they collect letters to Santa from mm -hmm. kids in CPS and in social services, mm -hmm. and we go buy Christmas gifts mm -hmm. for kids, and, and that might be their only, mm -hmm. the one thing that they get that year. Mm -hmm. um, coats, shoes, mm -hmm. basic things. Mm -hmm. And um, aside from 
what I talk about in the book, which is uh, emotional stability, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And for some of the, the some of the schools that closed, uh, those were schools where students and their parents mm -hmm. and their grandparents, in some cases, had all attended mm -hmm. the same school. Mm -hmm. And also, some of these schools were named after famous black people, mm -hmm. right? So Mahalia Jackson Elementary mm -hmm. becomes closed, mm -hmm. right? Um, Daniel Hale Williams mm -hmm. Elementary becomes closed. Mm -hmm. And this is a kind of symbolic gesture of violence that that takes its place in the milieu of a larger mm -hmm. um, pr pattern of devastation of, of black communities, mm -hmm. right? And so, so a school means so much more to folks in ways that I think, and, and I don't even want to say it doesn't, I mean, stuff like breakfast and coats, like that does not translate to wealthy people. But I think people of all backgrounds can relate to the idea of having an emotional attachment mm -hmm. to their school, mm -hmm. which just makes it so absurd that people are unwilling to kind of transfer that in an empathic way and understand why other people might also be attached to their school. I got to say, I couldn't until I read your book. Really? Yeah, no, I didn't. That didn't, it didn't immediately translate for me. I mean, I think like I had a basic skepticism of test scores bad, close to school. And interestingly enough, the first thing that occurred to me was safety. Yes. Oh, yeah. Which That's is a, a very huge real issue. issue yeah, in huge issue. Do you want to you talk? Well, about I mean, bit? Darion Albert, who was right. brutally, brutally murdered right. on camera right. uh, in, let's see, Eric Holder was already the Attorney General. I want to say 2009, mm -hmm. maybe. Uh, he was brutally murdered because um, he, two school, two high schools had closed. People in the community said, if you close these two schools, if you close this one school and merge it with another school, there will be violence because mm -hmm. there's kind of rival gang factions in these mm -hmm. different schools. And nobody listened, mm -hmm. and they closed the schools. And there was basically a riot in mm -hmm. the streets. And this 14-year-old boy got killed with a, a railroad tie. He That's got hit right. in the That's head right. and killed. On camera. On camera, mm -hmm. in front of his friends and peers and classmates, mm -hmm. not involved in any, you know, just trying to get home. And uh, so when the 2013 school closings were announced, his mother came out and said, children like my son are going to die if you do this. Mm. And so when we, that goes back to the question about test scores and things like that. And as a researcher, as a black scholar, I think part of what I'm always uh, conscious of is what things get um, constituted as legitimate evidence and from mm -hmm. whom, mm -hmm. right? So black people on the internet always joke when there's like a research finding that is something that your grandmother could have told you for free, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like that's your grandma or my grandma you know, has been saying. Mm -hmm. And I, I struggle in, in thinking, I'm always pushing myself and other people to think about what constitutes legitimate forms of knowledge, yeah. right? And so why is it, what, what a test score is, is a type of data. Mm -hmm. What a mother saying, if you do this, then this will happen, mm -hmm. that is also a type mm -hmm. of data, right? Mm -hmm. And so the question is, how do we reconcile those things? And how do we cope in a world where only one of those types of data is backed by institutional legitimacy? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's one of the things, this is actually, I think, an interesting arc, and I don't know if you found this necessarily in your career, but um, there are things that black people say in their communities, and you go into higher ed, which is all about rigor and all about testing and sites and all of this, and you say, well, maybe not. So the thing I always think about as a kid is like, you know, people would say stuff like, and they would say it, you know, this country was built on slavery. Right. And you go to college. You, you say, hear that well, every Saturday. You hear that every right. Saturday. But it's not, you know, it's not in the kind of rigorous right, way. There's right. no numbers. But people just sort of know. It's just this knowledge. And you go to college, and it's like, well, you got to cite this. You got to do that. And then you go through all the <laughs> citations, and you find out, yes, this country was right. built on slavery. Right, right. <laughs> If you have to write a whole true. case for reparations. That's you right. Have to, to do find all out with some dude on 125 already. Right, knew. right, right. You know, like instinctively. But that gets me. So I think one of the beautiful things about your book, me and Eve have this ongoing debate. Eve don't want to call herself a journalist, which is fine. I'm not going to rehash <laughs> that right here. I will just say there is some very good journalism in this book. I think I can say fair, that. Fair, fair. And so I, 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 I respect want, your opinion. <laughs> Thank you, Eve. Reasonable you know, people <laughs> could disagree. Reasonable yeah. people could disagree. <laughs> um, but one of the cool things in the book, though, is these voices, you know, of, of folks who are actually being affected. And so I think, like what you just said, sort of spoke to the significance of actually having, you know, uh, uh, folks like that, you know, actually speak in the book. I think there's an, another thing that's also significant, and this goes to the same place, where there's this charge that the school closings a racist. And there's a, you know, a, a woman in a book who's like a superintendent, a black woman, I believe. Yeah, Barbara Bird Bennett. She's she in prison like... now. That's not really, I mean, she uh, is. She's, she's, she uh, was indicted on bribery mm. charges. Um, she's the, per she's the, was the CEO who oversaw it's the, whole level. yeah, CEO. So she was indicted on, the CEO um, is in prison. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And then the person who replaced her had to step down because of 
uh, investigation of misconduct from the inspector general. So like our leadership is all jacked yeah, up, right? And people yeah, don't want, I mean, yeah. anyway, I have to say, cause it's like one of my favorite quotes and I'm sorry I, for interrupting no, you. No, no, go ahead, your go question. Ahead. But um, she, uh, Barbara Bird Bennett was taking bribes um, from companies that provide professional development for principals. So she would make sure that they got these contracts. The principals, principals who got this PD at the time were like, we knew this PD was bad. Like, the, but so they would be forced to take it. This company would get a contract and she would get a kickback from the contract. And so there are all these ways in which our public schools are being yeah. used for lucrative profit, right? Yeah. Newark, and Newark. Same, same deal, right? And so she, she got arrested and um, she had sent an email to her, the, one of the in, sort of indicting pieces of evidence was she had sent an email to this person that said like, you know, deposit the money, da 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 da. And she said, I have tuition to pay and casinos to visit. And um, so that's how they got her. Now I always, the joke I always make <laughs> is that, uh, you know she's not from Chicago because in Chicago, we don't send emails <laughs> about our crimes, right? right? right, you're, like, right, right, right. you're like, meet me by the spot. You have to like use a pay phone, you know what I mean? You're like, I'll see you over there, you know when. You right, know what I mean? Right, you don't right, send right, right, right. like, please send me the, the bribe money. You know, <laughs> send, you know? <laughs> Await bribe, like that is so basic. Who does that? Who does subject that? line, bribe. Yeah, subject line, bribe. Bribe. Right. Read you mean bribe. in kickbacks, right. Kickbacks. Kickbacks. <laughs> With an X. Right. <laughs> yeah, so, so she's out. She's out. But um, well, anyway. Before, before she got convicted. It's always, so Chicago politics is so fun. Oh, man. So fun. But once we got convicted, um, there was this charge that, I, this is not going to be better than that. I'm sorry. It's yeah, not going to be sorry. better than that story. <laughs> but, um. The, the charge that was made by a lot of parents was that this is racist, mm -hmm. the school closings are racist. And again, one of these situations where you look at it, you know, the well, what is it? I don't see race in this. And she, you know, sort of rejects that, look, I'm black one, it's not racist. Right. How dare you? How I'm dare a black you? One. How, How dare, dare you? you? I'm yeah. insulted. You're the right. racist for saying that right. it's racist. Right. It's racist of you to say that. Um, but again, I think, you know, we're speaking about knowledge that, you know, your grandmother knew, the people on the corner knew. <laughs> Yep. And you go through step by step and do the math of why this actually is racist. And you do it from two perspectives. First of all, from the perspective of housing and the perspective of, um, of, of actual education. So if you could just speak on those two things. First of all, the housing policy, mm -hmm. deep history of the housing policy, and the education policy of Chicago that these school closings are, in fact, ultimately built upon. Yeah. So, so the first chapter of the book. Now, exactly what you're saying like the reason I wrote this chapter which started out as a piece for the New Yorker that I wrote mm -hmm. the reason I wrote it was because it just didn't pass the smell test and mm -hmm. I knew mm -hmm. from regular black people mm -hmm. and from my own observation that it was very it, so in the, the community where I taught which is called Bronzeville which is where the book is kind of centered um, there had been massive amounts of public housing thousands mm -hmm. and thousands and mm -hmm. thousands of units mm -hmm. of public housing and everybody knew it was there because it was extremely visible, right? If you have ever been to Chicago and driven down Lakeshore Drive in the 70s or 80s or 90s, you saw the Robert Taylor Homes, mm -hmm. Stateway Gardens, mm -hmm. Ida B. Wells, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Hilliard Homes. Um, and so, uh, and th that had just been demolished in starting in 1999 mm -hmm. all the way up until 2009, 2010. Some of them were still standing. Like I remember the Ickes Homes were still standing. And so, um, you know, people like to talk about the president uh, and his ability to um, tell you that things that you saw with your own eyes aren't sure. real, but he does not have a monopoly on that and he did not invent it, right. right? There are people in our communities, including black people, who are perfectly willing to do that. And so the, the justification that was being given for why these schools were being closed is that they were underutilized, mm -hmm. meaning that they had very large capacity mm -hmm. and not a lot of students. So the building where I taught could mm -hmm. hold 960 kids, mm -hmm. and we had 280. Mm -hmm. Now, it had always been the plan for us to have 280. Mm -hmm. That was the official capacity of mm -hmm. our school in mm -hmm. terms of like the staffing capacity. Mm -hmm. And we used the extra space to build sets for plays, uh, have little conferences. Mm -hmm. ha you know, We used the space to do other things and ultimately a high school came and co-located with us um, but I knew that those kids part of why those built there were so many buildings that had such large capacity that were now empty was because the projects were there and they mm -hmm. had been torn down mm -hmm. and that was such a self-evident and recent historical event mm -hmm. 
to not be mentioned at all, mm -hmm. even in passing, mm -hmm. even briefly acknowledged. You mm -hmm. don't even have to take fault for it. It's not mm -hmm. your fault, Barbara Bird Bennett, that this happened, mm -hmm. right? Just like acknowledge that, you know what, maybe some of the reasons that the buildings are empty is because there was all this public housing and it mm -hmm. got demolished by Mayor Daley. Mm -hmm. So sorry, mm -hmm. it's rough, right? But we have to mm -hmm. figure out a way to maintain these buildings. It costs like $300,000 to deal with one of these buildings, right? Mm -hmm. Just say that. But the, the utterly insulting, degrading, uh, lack of any kind of historical acknowledgement of something that happened within a decade mm -hmm. was what it made me mad right mm -hmm. and uh, so that was kind of and and the story of how the public housing came to be is a long one but the short version is basically f starting in the Great Migration black people were concentrated in this part of the city through restrictive covenants mm -hmm. right which you have written about mm -hmm. extensively through physical threats of violence mm -hmm. right there were campaigns of physical bombings yeah. that Actual happened bombings at bombing like from from 1917 to 1921 there were 58 bombings right. that took place uh, which averaged out to one every 20 days right of black people who tried to move out of Bronzeville, mm -hmm. real estate agents who tried to sell to black mm -hmm. people, uh, mortgage lenders or bankers who tried to write physical bombings. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's not coincidence. And then the Public Housing Authority, once it was founded in uh, 1941, uh, initially tried to say, OK, let's use public housing as a social experiment to integrate mm -hmm. the city. Mm -hmm. And very quickly, they were afraid of upsetting white people, mm -hmm. both politicians and also mm -hmm. white residents. And so instead they used public housing to kind of re-entrench segregation mm -hmm. and just keep black people where they were. So that's how you ended up with this extremely high concentration of people and particularly of children mm -hmm. living in this really small place, which necessitated lots of schools. And on the school side, the superintendent at the time, Ben Willis, be any Chicagoans here? Okay, so, but y'all look a little young to know. <laughs> uh, what, does anyone know what it's called? The, the auxiliary trailers that were built? Nobody. Willis wagons is what they were called, right? So rather than let, when these schools became very crowded, rather than let black kids transfer to other schools, they would build these big mobile trailer units mm. and make kids go to school mm. there. And those became known as Willis wagons. Um, and black parents would literally lay their bodies down in the dirt in protest at the mm. place where they were trying to construct these mm. to try to prevent it from happening. So there was a huge kind of resistance. Uh, but basically the schools had been very crowded and were now very empty and none of that was accidental. It was mm -hmm. because of these kinds of policy actions that kept people in one place. And none of it was actually divisible from the fact of race. I think at one point Absolutely. you point out there's a point in Chicago school history where black kids can't even go to school the whole day. Right, right. So when these schools became super crowded, um, parents would say, well, let, just let us transfer to the other school, right? right? Can't have that. The other school's a white school. Right. Um, parents would show up and demand to enroll their kids in white schools and would be taken out by police, right? right? And so they came up with what they call the double shift schedule, which was that if you went to school, if you were a black kid who went to school in the 60s, you might attend school, if, say you're in K to five, you attend school half the day, you go home, and then the other half of the kids come mm -hmm. for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. So then you can double the enrollment of the school through the easy trick of just letting black kids get half an education. Yeah. Um, and again, this is my parents' generation, right? This is not ancient history. Right. They're, you know, when I give talks in Chicago, somebody always raises their hand yeah, and says, you know, I went to such and such elementary school and we did this. And right. I mean, this is not ancient history and that is why to go back to this question of, you know, it, it's not something you, until now it was not something you could necessarily read about in a book, yeah. right? But people knew, everybody knew. Right. So what I wanted to do was to make it legible in this way to say, yes, this really happened, right? I think one of the tools that, you know, people use to hide racism and perhaps any sort of kind of systemic violence or systemic oppression is they start the clock when they want to start the yes. clock. You know what I mean? Yes. So history begins when they say history yes. actually begins. And so somebody says, well, this is racist. Well, if I start the clock in 2010, nah. Right, You know right, what I mean? Hey, right, I just made a right. decision. We all you know just got I mean? here, right? Right, right. We're we all even. we all just got here. Right. You know, we're ahistorical <clears throat> um, when we want to be. You know, it, it strikes me, and we, we've talked about this a little bit, is that we, we have a multi-level problem, and I think this is even in your history of housing. Okay, so there's, if you think about housing during the 40s, 50s, and 60s, there is actual racism among the white people in these neighborhoods, right? Correct. right. So you, let's say, Chicago Housing Authority said, yes, you know, I went through, tried to integrate. I think like at airport homes, they had actual riots. I mean, yes. so. Yes, oh yes. So, so you have a base democratic problem, 
And then you have a structural problem of folks who actually just won't do, who are themselves racist also, who provide incentives and create racist structures. How does one begin to untangle that? I was going to ask you that. Uh, I mean, I think about it all the time, man. I mean, because yeah. there's, is it a question of, I mean, I think like the question of, well, you know, all the old people are racist and they're going to die off. I think that's, <laughs> that's not. That's but people not say it, man. People, they yeah. say it all the time. I think that's naive and overly optimistic. Well, we just looked at the teenage kids that's doing right. the Hail Hitler. That's right. I mean, that's right. so that's right. I don't know. Dylan that plan is, I mean, yeah, yeah. right. I mean, Yes, and and we also all know many elders who've been in the struggle right. as allies and accomplices for many years. And also, so. just to complicate it a little bit more, you can also even imagine a world where that actually does happen, but the system still exactly. remains in place. Exactly. You know what I mean? Exactly. So how does one begin to untangle that? Do you think? Yeah. Well, I think so. One thing, one basic prerequisite that is ne not sufficient but necessary, right? Necessary but not sufficient is first understanding what racism is and how it mm -hmm. operates and, mm -hmm. and naming exactly what you just named, mm -hmm. which is that I, I often say racism is like a perpetual motion machine, mm -hmm. right? Or in the book I say it's like a carousel, mm -hmm. right? It's going around. You think you're riding a horse, mm -hmm. but it's not you. Mm -hmm. It's going around. Mm -hmm. The horses are going up and down, mm -hmm. and they're going to keep going mm -hmm. without you, right? And if you do nothing, the default is that you are complicit in the movement that is already right. happening. Right. In order to not participate in that, the reason why the concept of anti-racist action mm -hmm. is so critical is because it, it helps us understand exactly that. You got to get off the horse, right. Right? right? You have to go find the panel and like smash, smash it. Smash it with or a crowbar. Because even once you get off, it's still going, That's right. right? And That's so right. Uh, I think that understanding that is actually really important because it helps us pinpoint exactly what you just said, which is that we have to name structures that with or without us are currently set up to mm -hmm. kind of perpetuate this. And we have to understand that even if it doesn't happen within our lifetime, we have to pinpoint specific ways to interrupt and disrupt those, structure, those structures to begin to kind of erode this right. edifice over time. So I'll give you one example that's just on my mind because it's been on the local news lately. Uh, ProPublica did some amazing reporting in Chicago that found out uh, that black people in Chicago are literally going bankrupt off of parking tickets and like basic like traffic by small traffic violations. Now, you remember that when the DOJ did their investigation in Ferguson, it was found that this was one of the major forms right. of criminalization that was happening in Ferguson, right? right? Was and plunder, like literally, literal funding, plunder. You literally were looting, funding the right. city. The city's budget was right. contingent right. upon right. 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 taking small right. amounts of money from black people right. en masse, right? right. And so, um, so lo and behold, in Chicago, it turns out uh, through this great reporting that we have the same problem. And I mean, literally going bankrupt over $50, $75 mm -hmm. tickets, people getting the boot on their car. Mm -hmm. You know, this is an example of, uh, again, if that's what you need to get to work mm -hmm. and so on. And so that's just something that just seems so, and there's, there's been such great local reporting on how this plays out and other things. Like black people in Chicago are more likely to get cited for not shoveling the snow mm. than white, than white mm. people and people in white neighborhoods. Mm. Black people in Chicago are more likely mm. to get bicycle tickets mm. Although mm. we are not the preponderance of mm. the cyclists in the mm -hmm. city, we are, we are overrepresented in right. the people, right? These are all just like small little things that actually add up in people's lives mm -hmm. where, you know, you get a warrant out, right? Now, I always, um, I shouldn't say this on camera, I most of the time do not pay the parking meter. And the reason is because it is a, I'm a conscientious objector. Because Mayor Daley sold right. the contract right. to our parking meter revenue right. to a private company. Right. And on a 75-year lease in exchange for a big pot of money that right. all got spent. Right. Right. So we got, he went to the currency exchange, he went to the check cashing place and said, got a payday loan right. on the right. parking meters. Right. right. And the money is spent. And now when I pay the meter, it doesn't go to the schools. Right. It doesn't fix a right. pothole. Right. It goes to this company. Right. right. So I have a very complicated algorithm that I run in my head to determine <laughs> the likelihood anytime I park my car of getting a ticket, right? Right, And most of the time I win. Right. I gamble and I win. Right. <laughs> now, every once in a while I did get a parking ticket, right? And, uh, you know, and I'll be slow paying them. Yeah. And one time I left one on the table and my husband's like, did you pay the ticket? And I'm like, no, you know. And he's like, you can't have me driving our car around with mm, an unpaid ticket. Mm, 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 right? Mm. And I really have to think about the fact mm. that I live in the world that somebody might come and take my husband to jail. Right, right because of a parking ticket. Right. These are the kinds of things that 
left that until we name them mm -hmm. and understand that these extremely menial, unimportant things mm -hmm. are extraordinarily disruptive and destructive in people's lives. Mm -hmm. And that's and, and find ways to interrupt them, which the good news is that because the problems are often small, mm -hmm. then the solutions can be simple. Right. Mm -hmm. That's why bail funds have been so phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Right. And Chicago is one of the first cities to, to really uh, to to fight that fight and say that people not being able to pay, you know, a bond that's one hundred dollars or seventy five dollars and then they miss work mm -hmm. or they lose their kids because there's nobody home to take care of their kids destroys people's lives mm -hmm. over one hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Right. And so to me, that is, that is where we can win. And it's a slow, it's a long, slow, protracted win. Mm -hmm. But it requires the first step of having the analysis to look and to not have this, you know, person come out and say, like, well, I didn't mean, it wasn't my intention. You know, well, I'm not a bad person. Like, right. okay, fine, but your parking right. tickets are ruining people's lives. Right. So right. now what do we do? Right. You know, and it also requires, it requires moral courage on the part of political leaders. Mm -hmm to do things that perhaps will be unpopular. And it requires uh, moral courage and imagination on the part of people who organize at the grassroots mm -hmm. and, and, and an understanding of making those kinds of demands, mm -hmm. right? And that's why you know, I become very cynical about electoral politics. I think electoral politics, politics are really important. Mm -hmm. But to me, the question is, how do we build our political capacity the mm -hmm. rest of the year mm -hmm. to have the parking ticket fight, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which like, as the person who sometimes shows up to that kind of meeting, like, mm -hmm. ain't no, it's me and the same 10 people at the parking mm -hmm. ticket meeting. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. don't nobody want to, everybody wants to march in right. the streets. Mm -hmm. Don't nobody want to come to the meeting right. about the parking tickets. Right. But that is the, but that's the struggle right. also, you right. know? Um, so yeah, I could go on, but. Necessary, but not sufficient, the, the electoral piece of it. Yeah, I mean, it has to be, it has sufficient. to be a top, right. Right. it's like drilling a hole from both sides, right. you know? I think that it, we have to demand political leaders who we have to demand things of our political leaders in ter that that will pay long term dividends. Right. But we also have to have right now kids in Chicago. So they're trying to build. And I promise I'll shut up with the answer to this question. But sure, sure thing. You're talking it's about show, mun municipal book, finance is something that I, you know, <laughs> become very passionate about. <laughs> but uh, they're trying to build a ninety five million dollar police academy mm. in Chicago. Right. So young people. Uh, have actually been going around, B young black people have actually, from Good Kids Mad City, which mm -hmm. is their organized group, have been going around on the street and asking regular people in front of the liquor store mm -hmm. on the corner, what would you do with this money? Mm -hmm. Like, what would you like to actually, mm -hmm. and they're writing it down mm -hmm. and do, right? This is kind of grassroots organizing and mm -hmm. asking questions, which not only helps you gather the information, but also catalyzes people's political imagination. Mm -hmm. What would I do with that money, mm -hmm. you know? That's my money. Mm -hmm. I'm paying for that. Mm -hmm. So what do I want? Mm -hmm. And I think that that is why we need to do that kind of ignite, like uh, imaginative igniting all mm -hmm. the time. I think there's something else in this too. Um, and this, is, this will be my last question. Then we can take it to, to q and I promise I'll let you guys talk. <laughs> um, but I, th I think like there's something else in this, like when we talk about unraveling this. And I think part of it is uh, who we valorize and who we do not mm -hmm. valorize. And so a lot of times, like in this, for instance, this fight against these Confederate statues, people say, well, that's just symbolic. But I think the symbols are very, very important. Yes. And you yourself have taken on, uh, as far as I'm concerned, a very powerful symbol in moving into the world of, of Marvel and comic books. I knew you were going to go there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I know it's powerful. Let me tell you how I know it's powerful. I don't so much know it's powerful, even though you see this, from the responses that I see from women and girls and from black people, I know it's powerful from the response I see from misogynist, <laughs> racist, and white supremacists. Oh, because mad. I see, you know, like, like I mean, and I'll just, I'm gonna do this preamble and then I'm gonna let you talk. I no, I'm gonna I wanna let hear, you finish. I wanna hear, I wanna hear what you have to say. <clears throat> so basically, I write, I, write, I write some comics, right? So one of the things that, um, you dab, you do a I dabble, I, I dabble, I do a little, I do a little something, know. something. I do a little yeah. something, something. So I've been watching this, right? And so the first complaint was, why are we taking established heroes and turning them black, turning them into women? You know, why, why can't we invent, you know, Why some... do we have Korean Hulk? Why do we have... Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Why, why can't we just have, you know, let Tony Stark be Tony Stark and have, you know, if you want your black female whatever, let's do that. Well, we had our, we got our black female whatever, Riri, and we got a black woman to, to, to write it. And people pissed a fit about that too. And it was not that I ever took it seriously, but it was quite clear at that point that, oh, you just want us out, period. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, it was in great sort of consonance with how white supremacy works. 
white supremacy is not in the business of coalition politics. Mm -mm. It's not in the business Ooh, of, 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 of making agreements. Right. You know what I mean? This is not a compromise. <laughs> right, this is, right. you know, me and I run this shit or it don't exist, period. Right. That's one, the one supremacy the part. That's the, it's called supremacy. Right. Right. It's, it's called in the supremacy. Name. It's in the yeah. name, actually. Yeah. It's actually in the name. And, and likely, you know, all of our systems, you know, uh, of oppression work this way. And so when you moved into this, and I know we talked about this as, you know, before you did it, were you shocked by the blowback? So, and first how have of all, you handled it too? So, first of all, I just have to shout you out publicly because there was the Robert Hayden moment. You, well, but the you. reason we really got cool was because you you really stepped up and mm -hmm. you were like, "Hey, it's me, Tanahasi," and I was like, "Oh, which one?" You know, <laughs> <laughs> Tanahasi Brown. You know, like, <laughs> oh, word, <laughs> cool. Hey, you know. Uh, <laughs> and but you really like had a conversation with me about it mm -hmm. after I after I got I had to, at once to to contend with like Ta-Nehisi Coates contacting me and Marvel contacting me <laughs> right I was like oh the world is ending you know like <laughs> this cannot this is not real um so so I just want to shout you out because you've been super supportive mm -hmm. and continue and warned me right mm -hmm. and also like you answer a lot of random questions for me. Mm -hmm like all week long, mm -hmm. um, and I really appreciate that. It's good to and have I'm, company. No, I'm frankly. really grateful for that. Mm -hmm. um, and Greg Pak is the other person that I always have mm -hmm. to shout out, so, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm just grateful. Um, so yeah, I was surprised. So the first time, so for those who don't know, uh, there was a petition that was circulated last year uh, saying that I should take over writing of this mm -hmm. character. So that was when the first, now I'm on Twitter 47 hours a day, right? <laughs> so. It's me or one of the bots pretending to be me. Mm -hmm. uh, or one of the monkeys on a typewriter that I've left. Um, so, so I, and people harass me about, people have called me every name. Mm. I've been called everything but a child mm. of God mm. on Twitter. You know, mm. I, I've been called every name. I have been, mm. I have fought, I have been attacked by people for everything from saying that R. Kelly is a rapist to saying that we shouldn't have police, to mm. one time I tweeted, um, I always, I, so as a sociologist, I always keep track of the things that make people super mad. Mm. Cause they're always funny, like I'm always like, so I'm out here every day talking about America is a fascist, white mm. supremacist, mm. country founded on chattel slavery mm. and indigenous genocide, that's all fine. Mm -hmm. Let me say something about Robert Kelly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> These people, the, the things that made people mad, I keep a running list. Things yeah, that made people so yeah. mad. Talking about R. Kelly, talking about gender reveal parties when I said, you don't actually know your baby's gender. Right, right, right. <laughs> oh, man. And then my other favorite one that made people super mad was I said, people take things I say on Twitter too soon. I said, um, I said, I know that if you <laughs> always buy free range eggs, you better be a prison abolitionist, <laughs> right? <laughs> Oh, oh, the rage, the rage. Oh, for days, people were like, chickens don't rape and murder people. Chickens don't rape. That was like everybody, everybody knows that they are creative with this like rhetorical retort that they, I'm going to show her chickens don't rape. You know, sit, tweet, you know, show her a thing or two. Eat my free range eggs. <laughs> uh, this is how you eat my eggs of rage, you know? Um, so, so I'm always like keeping track of these things and I'm like, really, you really mad about this, yeah. right? You know? Yeah. And uh, so, so when the Ironheart petition went up, the level of rage right. and the consistency, it right. was like just right. a flow right. of just you know, in every way, in every format, right. comments on the petition, right. tweets and moments, you know, like just, right. just blah, you know. At the petition. At the petition. At the petition. This, is a, this is a, and keep in mind at the time, this petition, petition for e-viewing to write for Marvel was roughly equivalent in my mind to a petition for e-viewing to be admitted to NASA and like go <laughs> to Mars. Like this is like, so, so whenever people are like, so, and one of the things I said was, I was like, oh, well me and Riri have the same haircut, right? Now I said this in jest mm -hmm. a lot. As I, if you follow me on Twitter, I say many things in jest, right? right. People took this very seriously, right. and to this day, what many of them say is, uh, "Well, she only got hired because her and Riri had the same haircut, yeah. right?" And I, to which I say, if you truly believe that a multi-million-dollar corporation <laughs> right, 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 right. 
hires Billion people. In fact. Billions, in fact. you know, <laughs> conservative estimate. Right. Hires people. <laughs> black people. Black people. Black, black women. women. Black women. Right. Of which I am. I am the fifth. Mm. Black women mm. since 1961 mm. to write for Marvel mm. Comics. Mm. Don't clap. Don't that clap. is horrible. Don't clap. That's not Boo, that's bad. That's, that's so bad. bad. I mean, thank. I appreciate the intent. <laughs> I recognize the intention of the clapping, but um, I see you. I appreciate mm. you. <laughs> but uh, but no, like that's trash. Right. And right. so so if if you really think that that's how I got this job, I can, I truly cannot help you. Right. As you know, I I pray for you. <laughs> <laughs> Best of luck with your life. But um, but I was super surprised, and I and I was fascinated. And what I what I've been saying in every interview since then, and now I will say it to your face. Mm -hmm. which was uh, that you were the person who said, um, no, they're right. They like, are. they are right. They are. Because this matters a lot. Mm. And the question of who our heroes are, mm -hmm. who we valorize, who, what our mythology is as a culture, mm -hmm. right? Superheroes, and we're thinking about this a lot in the, in the wake of Stan Lee's passing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The way that superheroes are our shared cultural mythology about who is good, mm -hmm. who is important, mm -hmm. who is strong, who is brave, who do we look to in times mm -hmm. of crisis, mm -hmm. right? Like, that is why Captain America, right? That's I right. mean, the fact that you are like, this is his existence, mm -hmm. and then the fact that you are now writing Captain mm -hmm. America is, mm -hmm. is so, you know, this is a dude that is out here with a star on you know a shield saying? made by, the, he's a soldier, right. you know? Right. And this is profoundly important. These, mm -hmm. are, these are the stories we tell our children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I think because it's quote unquote nerd culture, we somehow think that it's like in this box over here right. without remembering. With, that, with like Resident Evil or something. Right, right, right. right. But th th this is a billion dollar industry. Like a it lot is. of people are actually invested it in is. it. It is. And at this know? point, I mean, you know, the dawn of, of comic books was like my grandfather's mm -hmm. generation, mm -hmm. you know? And so mm -hmm. at this point, this is like a you know, who is more iconic right. than Superman? That's right. You know what I mean? That's right. And so, um, or Spider-Man, right. right? And right. So, I, so I think what you helped me understand was that, you know, I was like, I just don't get what the big deal is. Mm -hmm. I, I don't get what the big, I know what the big deal is for me and for black right. people and for right. black right. women in terms of representation, but I was like, why are y'all so salty right. that I'm writing fake stories about a pretend person that shoots laser beams right. from it's her hands? Because it's supremacy. Exactly. And they don't and compromise. They don't compromise. And it's also about qualification, mm -hmm, right? You're not mm -hmm, qualified, mm -hmm. right? Which, like, it, the comics are a new arena, arena, but, like, our grandparents got told they weren't mm -hmm, qualified, right? You mm -hmm. can, I mean, that, that part, I was like, oh, mm -hmm. I know that song, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. um, that's a long-time banger. Right. You ain't right, qualified. Right, right, right. White supremacy's right. great Classic. hits. Classic. Classic. You know? <laughs> It's on the it's on the CD commercial, you know, right, right, right. such as you know we don't take cut yet. Yeah, right, you know. right, 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 right. So so that I recognize, but I think you helped me really understand um, and to to reframe the work in my head mm. as as part of this culture war, yeah. right? And that that um, that that was not how I preferred to think about it, mm -hmm. but that those were the stakes that came to me, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I have to sort of rise to that occasion while also trying to write fun stories mm -hmm. about adventure and mm -hmm. fighting and like mm -hmm. choreographed fight scenes, mm -hmm. which I think a lot of people don't realize that that is also yeah. something, right? You don't just write the words on right. the page, you know? Fight. It's like, yeah, you don't get to write like fight, <laughs> right. you know? Uh, and so, so that's, been, that's been a lot and thinking about it in those terms is a lot. And um, the day that it was officially announced that I would actually be writing it, somebody tweeted me with a picture of his daughter mm. dressed in mm. um, like a little black girl mm. um, with her hair out, dressed in like a kind of too big Iron Man mm -hmm. costume, mm -hmm. you know, like kind of draping off her. Mm. And, um, mm. and he said, my daughter and I are so excited mm. and thank you for giving my daughter somebody to mm. look up to. Mm. And I literally have that in my phone, mm. right? And I will, I will put up with, you can call me any name, mm -hmm. you can, Come at me however you want to come at me if it means that this kid gets to that's right. be a hero. Mm. And um, mm. that's, you know, that's what it's about. Mm. Mm. 
so maybe um, we could do uh, a little bit of... I have a, no idea what time it is. Yeah, I know, I know. Oh, wait, wait, we were born we're here. We're rolling. Time we're rolling. began Okay, on so we got, we got time. That's, it was okay. my bad. I asked that comic book question. I knew where that was going. No, it was great. Um, you know I can't do concise answers. That's right. No, you're good. You're good. You're good. Um, so are we going to... Yeah, okay. uh, thank you, Mr. Coates. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know people have questions. Thank you for your curiosity, mm -hmm. Dr. Ewan. Thank you for Thank your you. generosity. Thank you both for a brilliant conversation thus far. Could you have a round of applause for both Thank of you? Thank you. I like the Jesse Jackson thing you did there. Thank you. The curiosity, the generosity, the that. ferocity. <laughs> That's a new one. I got to put that. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, I'm Kyle Dargan, Associate Professor of Literature and Creative Writing here at American University. Um, and I'll be running the Q&A for the rest of the night. Uh, as I said the last time Mr. Coates was kind enough to come here, uh, this will be a Q&A, not an SNR, not a statement and response. We're not doing that. Um, so please be respectful of our speakers and other audience members who may have questions. Uh, we have microphones. At it's the bottom of the stage at the left and the right. Uh, and we are streaming this event, so we would appreciate if you ask your question into the mic and speak up as well. Uh, so when you're ready, I will alternate back and forth between the microphones for as much time we have, about another 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Um, and who's ever first? And thanks, y'all, for coming. Appreciate you. Sure. Evening. Thank you both so much. I really appreciate it. Where? Oh, he hello. Hey, sorry. Can I speak up. I'm Andrew, I'm from Milwaukee, so close hey, to home. Hey, Midwest. Thank you. Uh, and my question specifically relates to the Midwest. Great, uh, this is a great question. Well, we're lucky enough, <laughs> well, we're lucky enough here to you know, be in a room of enlightened people ready to decry uh, you know, rewarding uh, education specifically based on test scores only. Back home in Milwaukee, in, you know, in Illinois, in rural Wisconsin, how can we sort of deracinate the parochialism that you know, the market-based solutions for education will fix our schools and cities, that test scores are all that matter for funding schools? How can we make that relevant to the population that's outside of the classroom, outside of discussions like this, that's you know, in the farm fields? Yeah, thank you for asking that. So, so the, I mean, in Wisconsin and in Chicago, Folks are waiting for you to, they're waiting for us to catch up, mm -hmm. right? Because, I mm -hmm. mean, Wisconsin had some of the, the most tremendous educational organizing, mass movement, people in the state house fighting the fight with people from Chicago driving up and occupying and bringing food and sandwiches, right, and, and making space. And I think that we are in a, an amazing time for grassroots organizing and education. I think that what needs to happen is for the conversations to, to be linked up between folks, right? So um, right now in the Boston Public Schools, uh, there is several schools that are up to be closed. And uh, somebody wrote a blog post this week saying that she bought copies of Ghosts of the Schoolyard and gave it to the school council members, right? Which for me, what I wanted to do was to bring together all of the information and make it easy for people in the way that other people, in the way that things like the case for reparations or the new Jim Crow or other people before me took information that was out there but synthesized it in an accessible way. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you're a scholar, which is the perspective I, pres I presume you're speaking from because you're saying us here in the classroom, uh, if you're a scholar, that's part of your job is to communicate and translate and synthesize things for people on the grassroots, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that there are people who are fighting this fight on the front lines that are, that are eagerly engaged in ongoing political education, that want to learn and have these conversations, and that are literally putting their bodies on the line for this fight. So, uh, and I think it's also our job to listen to them, right? So I think that I think it's happening. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. well, hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, so I wanted to like, I know that these are like larger policy issues, but I wanted to look at like kind of down to the level of your students and even like from early ages, because I so long had to navigate being a student of color with that like double consciousness before I had that, that language and sure. before I had that theory. Um, and like not only like how early can we start having those conversations with our students, but what do those look like and like how do the students get taught um, the context in which like all of these decisions are being made about their lives that they're not being informed about and I get to go to college and have take incarcerating blackness class and take right. race sex and gender in the US military um, you know and those are things conversations I needed to have earlier so right. like how do we do that and how early do we do mm -hmm. that 
Mm. And what's your name? Rasa. Thank you, Rasa. Mm. Um, Thank you. Also, you should feel <laughs> you should feel free to chime in on any of these questions. Got nothing to say. Uh, <laughs> um, All you. So I think that there are many uh, difficult conversations that we have with children out of necessity um, and that we need to start altering our consciousness to think about these as being equally necessary conversations. Um, now, that being said, black people for a long, long, long time have had to talk to kids about things before it feels developmentally the time, right? Uh, many young people learn about Emmett Till at a really young age, learn you can't do this, you can't go here, you can't talk that way, right? I think that young people will rise to the challenge when we find, at any age, when we find ways of having the conversation with them that are appropriate and give them opportunities to ask questions and build on the questions that they already have. So when children ask you, why is that person sleeping on the street? Right, thinking about what answer that you give. That's an opportunity to talk to a young person. Now, I understand that things like structures and all that kind of stuff seems really complicated, but I also think we have to give young people a chance. I was talking with a professor named uh, Michael Ralph, who's a professor at NYU yesterday, um, who did, we did an event together at the Strand, and he was saying his son, who's in sixth grade, worked with some other kids to, find what, to found what they call the Children's Freedom Fund, which is a bail fund run by kids. Now, when I was that age, we did the trick-or-treat for UNICEF, right? Nobody asked me did I want a trick-or-treat for UNICEF. We were given our little boxes, and we trick-or-treated for UNICEF, right, where we got extra change. And we watched a video. We would always watch, like, a harrowing video of children, malnourished children in other parts of the world, right? That was never really contextualized in any way for us. It was like we would just watch a really sad video. I would, you know, um, and if you're, like, the other black kid in the room, you're looking around, like, it's, you know, like, is that, you know, seeing yourself in this video, you don't see yourself other times in the classroom. Mm. So um, I don't understand why we can't translate something like that to, for example, fundraising for bail funds, right? Mm. That's, that's an example. There, and people are doing this work. There's a school in Chicago called Village Leadership Academy. Um, it's an independent school run by a black woman named Nakisha Hobbs. And last year they said, Eve, will you come judge our, uh, like, social justice presentations? People usually ask me, will you come judge the Poetry Slam or the Science Fair, you know, History Fair? And I was like, yeah, I'll come judge the social justice presentations. Now, what this was was that every grade level, starting in kindergarten, had chosen an issue that they cared about based on things they observed and come up with some sort of project where they presented it, they made a song, they did research. And the kindergarten class was, their issue was homelessness. So they, they were not too young to notice homeless people living outside near their school. And they were making demands, and they had looked up who our senators were. And they were saying, they were writing letters to, to Senator Tammy Duckworth saying, what are you going to do to help homeless people? And so I, you know, I watched this. It was amazing. And everybody had their thing, lead in the water, transportation access. Everybody had an issue starting in kindergarten. And I filmed it, and I posted a video of this little girl. And the senator replied to the tweet and was like, you know, I was a veteran, and I care a lot about homelessness, and I'm going to write you back, right? So these are five-year-olds. And I think that, as we all know, if we've ever tried to argue with like a three or four-year-old, <laughs> kids understand fair and not fair pretty early, right? And they will tell you it is not fair, right? And uh, I think that we need to find age-appropriate ways as early as possible to talk about that. And I, think you, and I also think that a, play, a role that educators and writers can play is creating age-appropriate material to have those conversations. So the last shout-out I'll do, and then I'll stop with this question, is um, Mariam Kaba, who's a, an amazing prison abolitionist organizer that I really look up to and that hopefully many of you know her work. She just self-published a book called Missing Daddy, which is a picture book about a little girl whose father is in prison mm. and talking about from her perspective about going to visit her daddy and the things they do together and how he misses her and she misses him and how kids make fun of her in school. That book is not just for kids whose, ki whose parents are in prison, right? That is for kids to learn that some people, kids of all backgrounds, to learn that some people have to miss their parents because they're in prison. So I think that writers and scholars and educators have a role to play in, in making these conversations easy and facilitating them. Mm. Thank you so much. Um, hi, oh. um, my name is Ray. I'm a huge fan of your poetry. Oh, thank you. Um, my question is about school boards. Um, when you take a look at um, meeting minutes, policy, platforms, speeches by um, elected officials in, you know, board of educations, what kind of 
language or policy positions sort of set off alarm bells in a way that you think mm. anybody paying attention to education issues should be aware of. Thank you. Oh, I love that. I'm sorry, You're trying, Eve, Eve, yeah. one thing. I just, I just want to add something yeah. in there. If you could just bracket off in there what your thoughts are when you hear the phrase achievement gap also. Are you putting a footnote on the question? I, I am like, putting a footnote. <laughs> it's like such a great question. It, it really a is question. a great question. Yeah. Um, I was just working on putting this in my syllabus today. So, so the, I'm going to answer your question first and then pivot back to your question. So um, achievement gap is a phrase that I don't use. Mm. Um, and, I, and this relates to the question because I think that in education, there are a lot of things that we take for granted without interrogating them, mm -hmm. uh, as in life. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of things that we take for granted without interrogating them. And I think achievement gap um, has gained kind of parlance as a way of talking about a lot, as a shorthand for a lot of things without actually talking about the things mm -hmm. and interrogating what it is we're actually saying. So for example, when we see in many school districts where Asian American students have much higher achievement on test scores than white students, we don't I'm call that an achievement, achievement gap, gap. Don't right? Don't call it an achievement gap. That's awkward. Right. Right? <laughs> for some reason, there's only this other gap. Uh, and uh, so because white students are presumed to be the kind of neutral norm. norm against yeah. which we are measuring all right. things, even when they themselves are not, you know, nationally, like across the board, <laughs> we just don't do that well at educating people in the United States, like ba based on pretty much any measure. Mm -hmm. Uh, measure, like educating the majority of people, we don't do great. Mm -hmm. right? High school graduation rates, mm -hmm. college, like however you want to measure it, literacy, mm -hmm. we're not awesome at this. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that what the, and the phrase achievement gap kind of recenters the problem around this gap, right? The whole, and if we just get the black kids up to close the gap, right? Mm -hmm. Without actually talking about, okay, what is this actually measuring? Mm -hmm. What are these scores really measuring? Where did they come from? Uh, how are we feeding people? How are we housing people, right? And so on and so on. Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to talk about the housing gap. I want to talk about the breakfast gap. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about the how did you get to school today gap. I want to talk about did you have boots and it's 20 mm -hmm. degrees outside gap. I want to talk about that gap, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we don't, we don't ever seem to get there. So to your question about school boards, um, I have been on a, a rant this week uh, and beyond uh, because in Chicago, we do not, I don't know where the questioner went. Where did you go? Okay, there you go. I, um, we do not elect our school board in Chicago. So we are the only district in the state of Illinois where the mayor unilaterally appoints every member of our school board. Um, I know it's terrible, right? So we don't have democratic go school governance. The only form of democratic school governance that we have is called the local school council, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's, a, it's a, at the school level. And so what I'm trying to fight for right now and what many people in Chicago are trying to fight for is just for us to have the right to vote on our school board members. And as we go into the mayoral election, pushing all the candidates to say, where do you stand on this issue and how are you going to move and push your influence at the state level to help us get an elected school board? So I have the right to vote for the incompetent person instead of you mm -hmm. appointing the mm -hmm. incompetent person. Let me at least, you know, mm -hmm. do my thing. So, um, but I think that for me, things I look for are number one, what is this person's commitment? I, I think like more broadly, if we're not just talking about school boards, like if somebody says, will you support this educational organization or this person or whatever, things I look for that are red flags um, or like green flags of goodness. I look for people who have a commitment to listening to uh, the stakeholders that are most impacted by education. I look for what structures do people want to have in place to hear the voices of parents and teachers and young people and actually have a structure in place for implementing the things that they hear, right? Do you have meetings regularly? Do you seek feedback from people? Um, I look to see if people are talking about the basic fundamental needs of our students that are not being met rather than just talking about this kind of hyper quantification. Um, I look for people that are interested in asking questions rather than presuming that they know all the answers. Um, mm. Education is really hard. Mm. I don't, I, every single day I'm confused about how to fix many things. Mm. So I'm always interested in people that have a, a stance of kind of inquiry and finding out and being open to learn more. Um, I, for me, a huge red flag is uh, really intense involvement with kind of some of the mega education foundations and also private companies and corporations that are funding things in education. Uh, whenever somebody asks me about an organization, like, will you support this organization? I go and look and see who's on their board. Um, and if 
if somebody from the Walton Foundation or the Gates Foundation is there, I'm probably not going to, like, I'm trying not to curse. I'm not going to hang out with them. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to ride with them, one might say. Um, and so, and that's because, uh, I mean, many of those foundations, it, even when people have really good intentions, have a way of getting attached to, sort, to certain interventions, regardless of whether they're actually supported by research, and then putting tons and tons of money in them in a way that radically shifts the landscape because people are desperate for money and resources, right? The Gates Foundation has been maybe the biggest culprit of this, where they put lots and lots and lots of money into one idea, and then recently have been like, you know what? Didn't really, didn't really work, right? Uh, which was the idea of focusing on having people have these small schools within schools. It sounded great. They put a lot of money into it. A lot of people chased that money. And now 10 years later, we're kind of left with the aftermath. So um, the point is, is that I'm always interested in people that are, are more dedicated to asking questions from those who are most impacted than pretending that they have all the answers and kind of having like a dogmatic attachment to one answer. Uh, hi, my name is Nathan. Uh, I'd like to thank you guys both for coming here to AU. And, thank you. Can you use the mic? Oh, uh, thank yes. you. Uh, and my question centered uh, around something that you talked a little bit briefly about in your uh, last answer to a question is how do school closings really impact the way that students get to school on a regular basis, whether it be through public transportation, like the school bus system, or through parents having to drive their kids to school? Yeah, great question. Also, you all can ask me about anything, you know, but, <laughs> but I will answer that question. Um, so I, it depends on the local, con do you mean in Chicago particularly or in, in general? Either, I mean, uh, obviously you probably have the most experience in Chicago, but it would be really interesting to know about anything that you could provide on this issue because I come from West Virginia and it's fairly rural and I did not live within the bus system mm -hmm. for my school, so mm -hmm. I had to rely on my parents or one of my friends being able to get me to and from school every single day. And so that meant that sometimes I had to be at school like 30 or 40 minutes before right. like, the bell sounded to accommodate my parents' work schedules. So I'm so glad you gave that additional context because I want to say that rural school districts actually have huge amounts of school closures that are devastating to communities. Mm. I mean, talk about a school mm. being a pillar in a community, mm. right? Mm. It might be the only institution that people share mm. for miles or hours around. Mm. And um, it's extremely under-theorized and under-discussed under in the literature. Um, there's lots of stuff about school closings in Chicago and Philly, lots of papers. Um, but if there are any scholars in the audience who are interested in this topic, I'm, I'm, I'm co-authoring a lit review with somebody right now about this. and. Um, yeah, rural schools are extremely underrepresented in the literature compared to how devastating this is and how frequently it actually happens. So I think that that question of transportation is one of those things that um, there are so many ways in which the divisions of class in the United States uh, lead people to these divergent realities that, they, that it just never even occurs to other types of people that this is a reality, right? And I think that transportation and how you get to school is such a big deal because it plays into how much children can sleep per night, right? Which is a really, really big deal. Children need a lot of sleep, and it actually has huge cognitive impacts if they don't get a lot of sleep. Uh, things like breakfast. Are you going to get breakfast because you're rushing or because you have to you know, get up early? Um, safety, right? In Chicago and many other places, it gets really cold and really dark after a certain amount of time. Um, I, had a, I taught eighth grade, so I was always trying to keep in touch with my students when they went to high school. And one of my former students went to this amazing high school, and she, you know, she was saying that she didn't get to do any extracurricular activities because if she stayed late, she'd have to go all the way back to her neighborhood. It would take an hour. It would be cold. It would be dark. It wasn't safe. There was nobody to pick her up, right? And those are the things that if you have money, it just does not mm -hmm. occur to people, right? That's something like not having a reliable car or a car that breaks down, mm. right? Uh, having to rely on the bus schedule, having to ride a bus that doesn't feel safe to you, right? Um, many of us grew up in places where we had kind of a choreo of like, like where I grew up, I knew, okay, I can't be on this corner, right. but I can get off at this corner. That's so right. I'm gonna ride the bus to here and then walk back. Like I need to go, mm -hmm. I had a whole mm -hmm. path, right? To mm -hmm. avoid where I didn't wanna be. Mm -hmm. And those are things that some people just don't think about mm -hmm. and then they become totally unaccounted for in policy decisions. 
So, you know, everybody's talking this week about um, how the newly elected congressperson, uh, Ocasio-Cortez, it, she's broke, right? She's like, I don't, don't, I cannot afford to live in D.C. while I wait for, for this. That. Yeah, her. which like, you know, that was me when my first fall as a Chicago right. public school teacher, right? right? I had all these extra jobs in the right. summer to try to. And so that's an example of like, this was not designed with us in mind. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's sort of a roundabout answer to your question. The sh short answer is it matters a lot. Transportation matters a lot. In Chicago, it's more around, it might be a distance that's walkable or busable, but it's more around safety. And one of the things, this is an example of like, um, you know, I, I visited Hawaii last year. And in Hawaii, uh, there's all these mongooses everywhere. It's not mongoose, etymologically. OK, look it up. Mongooses. <laughs> Don't shade me later, because I said mongooses. <laughs> Google it. All these mongooses are everywhere. And the reason the mongooses are everywhere is because when they used to have the plantations in Hawaii, they didn't want rats to come in and eat the sugar cane and the pineapples. And so they're like, the mongooses will catch the rats, right? Mm -hmm. Now, mongooses, <laughs> it's a really fun word to say. <laughs> Mongooses hunt in the day and rats come out at night. And uh, so it didn't work at all. And now there's just like an overrun. There's like mongooses everywhere, right? And uh, the reason I bring this up is it's like there's a way in which people come up with absurd policy solutions to like uh, there was one, one of the things that was promised when the schools were closed was that all the new schools would have air conditioning. Uh, which, which is like a big deal in Chicago because it gets super hot. And that promise was not kept. And so they sent all the teachers. Uh, teachers came to work one day, and everybody had these paper fans in their mailboxes. And they're like, just distribute the fans <laughs> to the kids, right? It's like an absurd. So the reason I bring this up is because there's a program in Chicago called Safe Passage, which is that they hire local people from the community to stand at the corner and uh, wear like a yellow safety vest. They are unarmed. It's usually, it's usually the person that would have been doing that anyway, right? It's like somebody's grandma standing on the corner with this yellow vest. And, like, and that was the solution, uh, and this costs money, right? Instead of saying, OK, well, what can we do about the violence in the city? And, what? and somebody, I, I, I don't think this quote made it into the book, but there was one of these safe passage people. And she was like, when people come out and shoot, I'm ducking and dodging with the kids. That was her exact quote. Yeah. She was like, I, what am I supposed to do, yeah. right? I have this vest on. So that is one of the solutions that has, been, that has been put forth. And I think that I'm not saying that it's a bad thing to have community-based people stand and usher kids to school. I think that could actually be awesome. But it's an example of like kind of patching over a problem with this somewhat strange policy solution, the fans in the mailbox, right? Instead of actually thinking critically about what can we really do about this. So thank you. So I just, how are we doing on time? Yeah, these may be the last two questions. Okay, okay. I'll try okay. to be. Okay. I can't make any promises. I'll try my best to be brief. Okay. 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 Hi, I'm Whitney. So I'm from Philadelphia, and you talked hey, about Philly. yeah. You, I so love you talked. Philly. It's an excellent city. Everyone should love it. But um, you talked about the school closings in Chicago, and I wanted to know in your research or in your preparation for the book, did you look at all at, at how there were similarities across the cities? You mentioned Paul Vallis. Mm. He was superintendent when yep, I was a student. Sure was. Um, in Philly, and so and Philly has went through a wave of school closings around the same time in Chicago. So did you did you look at all about how the similarities in policies? Um, are replicating across cities across the country. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. So Detroit, Philly, Chicago, Baltimore are all really similar in the ways, to a lesser degree, New York and also DC and Newark. What do all those cities have in common? Mm. <laughs> mm. Uh, they're very similar in the way that the school closings have happened. And now, now Boston is also happening. And I think that there's a, a pattern of uh, black post-industrialized cities that have large populations of black people uh, who are kind of hanging on as these cities continue to be remade and evolve in ways that are not for us, uh, continuing to be in public schools as, the city, as these cities are transforming themselves into this new iteration of what they want to be in the 21st century. And uh, the presence of, of poor black people is inconvenient for that plan. And, um, and I think also these cities, another thing that they all have in common is they, they were kind of, they rode the wave of industry, of American industry, during a certain period of, of affluence and success, right? And that we're now seeing the, the, the decline and the downfall of that. And so people are struggling 
and uh, not able to have the same kind of stability, class stability or class mobility that they once did. Um, I think that all of those things play into why we see very similar patterns across all of these cities. Um, the Philly school closings were happening in 2015, so it was right when I was uh, d like doing a lot of writing for what became the book. Um, and if you know anybody in Philly, I'm going to be there uh, on the 28th. I'm doing, a, oh, I'm doing, the day that Ironheart comes out, I'm going to be doing a signing at Amalgam Comics, mm. which is a black woman-owned uh, comic shop in Philadelphia. Um, but I'll also be doing a, a reading from the book the next day, the 29th. And what I've been doing in Detroit and Philadelphia is trying to open the events with people from the local context mm. to come out and say what they have to say about what they experienced. Mm. So you probably know more about it than I do, but I absolutely do think that it's the same. It's the same pattern, and I think it's not a coincidence. Mm. Thank you. Hi, so I'm cognizant that we're running short on time, so I'll try to be that's as concise okay. as that's possible. That's okay, that's our fault, it's not your fault. <laughs> well, I also tried fault. to write out my question so as to keep Great. it concise. Um, so thinking about what you were saying earlier and the role that we're expecting our schools and our teachers to play in addressing some of the needs that extend past academics and past that curriculum, um, my partner is the director of social justice education at a school that is all boys, it is predominantly affluent, predominantly white. Um, they got a director of social justice education? education. Yeah, <laughs> they do. Um, but that's a different thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, buddy, so, I have to open the water for that. <laughs> and so he, and in the, in the demographic and the school area is hot, a lot more conservative than he anticipated when he accepted the job. Mm -hmm. um, and so he's having a hard time trying to do some of that like intellectual gymnastics you were talking about with trying to communicate nuanced and complex topics to young kids. It's a middle and high school, mm -hmm. um, especially in that tough demographic. And so do you have any advice on mm. tackling issues of race, class, and other issues with younger kids, especially when the world around them is teaching them bias? Mm. Um, is it really your partner? Is it you? No, it's my partner. Okay. <laughs> You're like, my friend, Got my friend, friend just right? wants to know, and you, my friend is having a real hard time. Me, I mean right. my friend. My, my friend. <laughs> no, there's someone in the audience who also knows him. Oh, really okay, right. so this is a real person. <laughs> and what's your name? You didn't say your name. Minty. Think, Think like gum or toothpaste. Thank you, Minty. Um, so... You know, you're highlighting the age part, but I don't think it's the age part that's complicated, yeah, wah, wah. right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think that, uh, I think it's probably the race and the class part that's complicated, right? And the gender part. Am I, I mean, I would, one, I would surmise, one might surmise. Um, and, you know, that's always a really tricky question for me because, you know, for years people would ask me, like, I'm teaching this group of white kids about race and, like, what can I assign to them? And this created a conundrum for me because I have never been white. Mm. And so mm. I never had to mm. learn mm. about racism from a book, right? Mm. I got mm. called the N-word for the first time when I was like six, mm. right? And my mom had to, and, and I, another thing that happened around that time was somebody put um, a flyer for a Klan march on all the cars on my street. Mm. Right? Mm. I was like, my mom didn't ask for that. She was like, I don't know, I didn't ask for these problems, mm -hmm. you know? Um, my little cousin, when, when she was seven, we were getting ready to ride bikes. I was an adult and I was, we were like putting, I'm like helping her and with the train and wheel and putting it. And she goes, did you know that white people used to own black people? <laughs> I was like, meh, meh. <laughs> abort, abort. You know, I was like, <laughs> I was like, I did. <laughs> Why don't you tell me what you know about, tell me more, you know, like trying to fit, like I was freaking out, but trying not to, right? So like black people, don't really get to pick mm, when we mm. talk to our kids about race, right? Um, and so, so one time I went on Twitter and I was like, white people, please tell me like where you first learned about racism. Mm. Like how did you, you know? And people's answers were amazing. So the number one answers were, many people said the autobiography of Malcolm X, mm. right? Um, <laughs> I don't know what that was. Somebody shaded Malcolm X in the audience. Somebody said the autobiography of Malcolm X. Several people said the movie Friday. And uh, I'm just giving you the modal responses here. Autobiography of Malcolm X, as told to Alex Haley. The movie Friday and Public Enemy. That's like in between. You're like, ah, you know? 
Um, and I think that what we can learn from that is that literature and so many people said fiction, right? Mm. Literature and popular culture mm. uh, do so much to educate young people. And we are living, I, I was, for some reason, mm. the other night I was thinking about Lois Lowry. I don't know why I started thinking about Lois Lowry. And I was thinking about The Giver and I was thinking about Number of the Stars, right? And so at like 1 a.m. I started reading all these articles about Number of the Stars and mm. like, and I was think that's the first time I learned about the Holocaust was from Number mm. of the Stars, mm. right? And I think that um, literature, and, and we had a Holocaust survivor come to my school and talk to us, and I'm thinking about that a lot now as so many young people and adults seem to be horrifically unaware of, of the Holocaust and of mm. other human rights atrocities, right? Um, and I think that we're living in a really phenomenal, unparalleled age for children's literature and young adult literature, um, as well as teachers putting all kinds of incredible resources online uh, for young people to learn about things. And so um, I think that your partner, who is real, who is definitely real and exists, um, it is, has a lot of resources at their disposal um, that, that I hope that they won't feel like they're alone. Um, and then I think that it's, a, it's time to marshal those resources and, and share them, right? And share them with other people and make lists and ask for recommendations. The trickier thing that I can't help you with is the <laughs> institutional environment in some of these mm. places, right? And why, for instance, a school might say, we're going to pay someone a salary mm. to be mm. the director of social justice education, mm. Mm. but still have a predominantly you know, wealthy white student population and not say, you know, we're going to have these kinds of scholarships or what are we going to do to, do to actually extend the resources mm. that we have here in the capital mm -hmm. to other people that could use them, which would be a sort of redistributive way of addressing this instead of just, you know, teaching other kids about social justice, but which is also important. So that is an institutional question that I can't help you with. Uh, but I do want to take the opportunity to say that I'm always profoundly suspicious mm. of institutions that mm. have no enacted uh, evidence that they truly care about anybody's racial justice, mm. right? But that profess to care um, in, in word rather than in deed. Mm. And I'm always extraordinarily suspicious of that and try not to get myself in situations where I have to pretend to believe somebody that mm. I have no reason to believe about their intentions. Are you shading me? Am I shading you? Yeah, no, shady. why? Why you? I'm, just saying, I'm not shading you. I had a conversation with somebody about reparations. Oh, no. What are you talking about? Mm, we'll talk about that. Oh, least. gosh. No, I'm not shading you. I'm shading every university. That's what okay, I'm, right. I'm shading every university in America. Huh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I'm so, now I really want to know how, you no. You don't remember? No, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, we okay, should end right, this now. Okay. Yes. <laughs> wait, wait, no, but we can't. We can't. We can't. Can can can. I want you to do the thing. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, speaking of literature, I'm sure we have some fans of your poetry in the audience. Yeah. I noticed right. there's a oh, book by your foot. Yeah, okay, great. We are. We are. This uh, is a, such a treat for me. I mean, I, I, as I said, Eve is, um, um, what are you I'm losing all my words. I can't right believe now. you said, are you shading me on the live stream? Oh, so I, didn't, I didn't realize it was being <laughs> live streamed. <laughs> She's not shading me. I'm shading universities. <laughs> okay. All right. Eve, 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 Eve is, um, which I'm, I'm going to try to get back in her good graces right now. Um, <laughs> Eve is a multidimensional threat. And um, again, before I actually read Ghosts in the Schoolyard, I read Electric Arches, which is absolutely phenomenal. Um, there was a poem in this book that I taught in my nonfiction class last year because I was just so in love with it. Um, and so, Eve, if you'll just take us out. This is such a treat. You guys have no idea what you're about to see. Oh, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. I don't usually, can I stand? Is that going to mess everything up if I stand up? Okay. I, actually, can I use your mic? Sorry, this, no, it's in my pocket. Never mind. It's becoming a whole thing. I can't sit down and read poems, guys. <laughs> it's not cool. Um, thank you all so much for being here. I'm going to read uh, Ta-Nehisi asked me if I would read this poem, which is the first poem in the book. Um, and it's a true story from the future. And Eve, just really quick. Yeah. This is how I knew you'd be all okay for comic books when I read this. Oh. I mean, seriously. I mean, go. go. I'm going to stop commenting. Y'all want to hear the oh, poem. Y'all don't want to hear me. I go hope ahead. I'm okay. Um, so this poem was inspired by something I read that Asada Shakur said, which was, black revolutionaries do not drop from the moon. We are created by our conditions. Mm. And I think she meant that as like a metaphor 
right, to say that uh, when you see black people protesting and engaging kind of righteous rage, um, that there's a reason for that, and that is that uh, we have faced these kind of generations of oppression and systemic violence, right? Um, but I think that when I read that, I'm sorry, can you please not film me? Thank you so much, it's really distracting, thanks. Um, when, I when I heard that black revolutionaries do not drop from the moon, the Afrofuturist in me thought, but what if they did, right? Yeah. So this poem is about that. It's a true story from the future, and uh, thank you so much. It's called Arrival Day. It happened under cover of night or early morning, depending on who you ask. The hour when the press stops running, when the baker arrives and unlocks the door. The cables came down. Silent and charcoal, matte and slithering, they hit the earth and coiled at the foot of a tree, on a bus stop bench, atop a mound of cigarettes in front of the dialysis center. Later, when the NASA boys looked for footage of the arrival, surely some security camera in some parking lot somewhere in America. That hour was all blank, everywhere all blank, like as if each of them had a magnet for a beating heart, their veins murmuring, clear it away, clear it away, until the tape was empty. In the years before, when hateful men warned of the coming, crushing aluminum cans with their hands while their friends threw darts, or in rowboats tying flies, they spoke only of darkness. Their eyes will be dirt, the men said, and they will cover the windows with tar in the places where we talk to God. They will seize our daughters who will return to us in rags, holding mud babies and asking for a room to sleep. The hateful men and their wives wore reading glasses and drank cinnamon tea on the days when they wrote letters to each other about how the coming people would steal, how they loved the sound of grinding teeth in place of real music, how the girl ones were greedy and lustful and felt no pain but made endless noise, and how small ones could trick you looking like children but their skin was mercury and they could not be shot dead, so do not fall for it. They wrote their letters on glass, and plastic and metal, they said, they are coming and they will paint everything black. Mm. So they had no words for the moon people when they did come. And the moon people could not be captured. Camera lenses looking on them turned to salt and cast white trails across the eyelids of the looker. And the moon people were dressed in every color. They wore yellow and cool cigarette green and Georgia clay red. And they wore violet. They wore violet and they were loud as their hands worked, hammering the iron of the jail cell doors into lovely rock curls and bicycle chains, smashing the fare boxes at the train stations into wind chimes and bowing low to the passengers as they entered. Some sashaying through the turnstile, some dropping it low as they went underneath, they sang. The moon people had been listening all this time, and they knew all about Sam Cooke and Aretha Franklin and Mahalia Jackson and Marvin Gaye and Missy Elliott, and they sang while they smashed a bottle on the squad cars, a Hennessy bottle or a Coke or a pressed kale juice, whatever was near enough to say, this here is christened a new thing, and they drove them down my street and your street and your street, the tires painted to look like vinyl 45s, and the children tied yarn and ribbon to the windshield wipers, and the moon people turned them on high, so as they drove, the colors waved in the sunlight, which was now streaming so clearly onto the porch where I sat, rubbing the rusting chain of the swing and thinking of grass when the boy down the street, who in smaller days I walked to school when his mother worked early, who loved lime popsicles the best, who danced his way from his own porch to the basketball court in the afternoon, who the police had recently declared a man, stopping him mid two step to ask questions he could not answer because the query beneath each of them was, why are you alive? And none of us can say, that boy, he came to me and he walked up the steps where the paint is peeling and knelt at my side. And I did not look him in the eye. Instead, I watched a firefly, the first of the summer, land on his left shoulder and I thought, here are two glowing ones. But he did not notice, only held my hand and told me, we are free now. And I could not believe I had lived to see it. The promised light descended to us at last. Thank you so much. Mm. Thank you, Tanahasi. Mm. Thank you. I appreciate you.